Jimi Hendrix is the singular most powerful and influential force in rock music. His impact on the primary instrument of rock, the electric guitar, far outweighs any one person's contributions to the rock genre. One could argue that Robert Johnson is the only one in the conversation with Jimi due to Mr. Johnson's seminal influence on blues guitar, which became the foundation and basis of R&B, jazz, rock, and the majority of what we would call today popular music. To include Mr. Johnson, you would have to base your arguments on a well-researched scholarly argument, which would bore most people to death. On the other hand, to see and hear Jimmy's influence, all you have to do is listen to music for the past 50 years. You can hear Jimmy's guitar stylings in a wide variety of genres across the board. You can visually see his influence in the flamboyant dress, style, and swagger of the artists that came after him. These observations about Jimmy are crystal clear to me right now as an adult, but growing up in New York City as a young black kid in the 80s, Jimi Hendrix was nowhere to be found. My family members never spoke about him. My friends and classmates at PS95 in Brooklyn, New York never spoke about him. It was all about Run DMC, The Fat Boy, Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh, Michael Jackson, Prince, Tina Turner, and all the other iconic 80s artists. I've written extensively about my unique journey to not just discovering Jimi Hendrix, but also on my research asking probing questions about his low profile in the black community. Initially, I labeled it as a lack of respect from the black community, but discovered that it was a bit more nuanced than that. The more I learned about Jimi Hendrix, the more I realized that many black people either had little to no information about Jimi Hendrix, they had information about Jimi Hendrix that was heavily Eurocentric, they had inaccurate misinformation about Jimi Hendrix, or was just flat out told lies about Jimi Hendrix. In other words, there was an overabundance of low quality information designed to make Jimi Hendrix less desirable to many black people. Many black people may have looked at the contrived and artificially manufactured image of a wild psychedelic rock hippie that the mainstream media pushed about Jimi and said, no thanks, hard pass. Jimi's influence on black popular music like funk, R&B and soul, jazz, and even hip hop were marginalized, pushed to the side, and sometimes even disparaged or denigrated. Many people overemphasized his exploits in the world of rock, which leads them to devalue and sometimes even denigrate his R&B roots. Instead of seeing images and videos of Jimmy backing up R&B and soul legends like Little Richard, the Osley Brothers, and Wilson Pickett, most of the images pushed onto the public featuring Jimmy showed him with Janis Joplin, The Who, Mick Jagger, Eric Clapton, and other mainstays of the swinging 60s London scene or San Francisco's hippie scene. Instead of seeing images and videos of Jimmy playing the United Block Association's benefit concert in Harlem and plentiful images and videos of Jimmy playing with the band of Gypsies, we see an overwhelming and lopsided representation of Jimmy playing with his two English bandmates, Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding, in the original Jimi Hendrix experience, usually in the setting of Woodstock and the Monterey Pop Festival. Today, the representation of Jimmy is more equitable and balanced, but there is still some room for improvement. So the purpose of this documentary is to fill in the gaps of this low quality information that's been floating around concerning the great Jimi Hendrix.
How do you explain the fact that a black man from the poorest parts of Seattle, Washington, the Central District, is one of the most revered, often imitated, and highly regarded musical geniuses of all time? How do you wrap your mind around the highly implausible notion that a black male high school dropout has crafted some of the deepest and most beautiful lyrics that have ever been recited around the world and even studied in some of the most prestigious colleges and universities. Another feature has uh, Jimi Hendrix lyrics on the side. Uh, I'm sure you can tell this one. Angel came down from heaven yesterday. She stayed with me just long enough to rescue me. And she told me a story yesterday about the sweet love between the moon and the deep blue sea. And then she spread her wings high over me. She said she's going to come back tomorrow. And I said, fly on my sweet angel, fly on through the sky fly on my sweet angel tomorrow I'm gonna be by your side next part sure enough this morning came on to me silver wing silhouette against a gold against a child sunrise and my angel she said unto me today is the day for you to rise take my hand you're gonna be my man you're gonna rise and then she took me high over yonder, Lord. And I said, fly on my sweet angel. Fly on through the sky. Fly on my sweet angel. Forever I will be by your side. Jimi Hendrix. See, they got another lyric on the side of the Jimi Hendrix Memorial Park here in Seattle, Central District. Let's see how you figure this one out. Well, she's walking through the clouds with a circus mind that's running wild. Butterflies, zebras, and moonbeams and fairy tales. That's all she ever thinks about. Riding with the wind. When I'm sad, she comes to me with a thousand smiles she gives to me free. It's all right, she says, it's all right. Take anything you want from me. Anything, anything. Fly on, little wing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Little baby, little wing, 1967. Well, one of the ways that these facts have been explained away is to craft a narrative of Jimi Hendrix as an extraterrestrial, otherworldly being with superhuman abilities. Or as the professor of funk, Ricky Vincent, once said, a colorless rock avatar. Another troubling narrative to explain the excellence of Jimi Hendrix is to dilute his race culture and personality. To be clear, African Americans or foundational black Americans or African descendants of slaves or just plain black people have always had a diverse ethnic and racial background. Despite the many added ingredients in the gumbo of African Americans, we have always had a shared and unique culture due to racial segregation and shared experiences. Jimi Hendrix was no different. His lineage is similar to many African Americans all over the United States, including myself. Jimi's ancestry has been twisted and convoluted in order to dilute, weaken, and diminish his black roots. On Jimi's Wikipedia page, his African American ancestry shares equal billing with his Irish ancestry for some strange reason. 
Although his parents and grandparents on both his maternal and paternal side were considered black or African American. Let's take a simple look at Jimi Hendrix's family tree. We'll only go as far back as his great grandparents on both sides. We'll start on his father's side, James Allen Ross Hendrix, better known as Al Hendrix. We start in the small Midwest town of Urbana, Ohio, where Jimmy's grandfather, Bertrand Philander Ross Hendrix, was born in 1866. His mother, Fanny Hendrix, was a newly freed former slave looking for work as a recently divorced single parent. She sought work on the property of Bertrand Philander Ross, a very wealthy white grain dealer. Clearly, Fanny was taken advantage of and violated, since Bertrand wouldn't even acknowledge the existence of the child he helped to create. Fanny gave her son the name of his father to let the community know about the evil deeds of Mr. Ross. As you can imagine, Jimmy's grandfather faced a lot of racism and shame being the product of an illicit interracial affair. During those days, young African-American women had very little say over their bodies and were at the mercy of any white man who took a liking or fancy to them. Needless to say, Bertrand Philander Ross Hendrix migrated to Chicago in 1896 looking for better opportunities. He changed the spelling of his last name to Hendrix H-E-N-D-R-I-X in Chicago and found work as a police officer. Eventually, he quit and found work traveling as a stagehand with a vaudeville troupe. When the troupe broke up in 1912, he found himself in Seattle, Washington. There, he would meet Jimmy's grandmother, Zenora Moore, who was born on November 19, 1883 in Georgia to her mother, Fanny Moore, who was half Cherokee and half black, and her father, Robert Moore Sr., who was a freed slave. That would make Nora, Jimmy's grandmother, 25% Cherokee, far from the full-blooded Cherokee accounts that you see erroneously printed in many Hendrix bios. As a young 20-something-year-old woman, Zenora began performing as a dancer with a traveling vaudeville group. That's how she met Jimmy's grandfather, Bertrand. Once life on the road ended, they decided to get married in Seattle, but would soon move to Canada in Vancouver, British Columbia. They had five children altogether, three surviving and two dying at an early age. It was their fourth child, James Allen Ross Hendrix, who would become the father of Jimi Hendrix. Now let's look at Jimi's family tree from his mother's side, Lucille L. Jeter. Once again, Jimi's great-grandfather on his mother's side was an unknown white man from Alexandria, Virginia that took advantage of Jimi's great-grandmother, Elizabeth Brown. Elizabeth was only 14 years old when she had Jimmy's grandfather, Preston Moses Jeter, in July of 1872. Later, Preston would go to work as a day laborer on the railroad. His job would at some point lead him to the Seattle area between 1900 and 1912. Jimmy's grandmother, Esther Clarice Lawson, was born to Miles Lawson and Amanda Williams in Texarkana, Arkansas in May of 1892. The 1880 census labeled Miles as a Negro and Amanda as a mulatto. They were both born in Mississippi. Preston and Esther Clarice met in Seattle and were married on May 20th, 1914. They had six children with their youngest girl, Lucille Jeter, becoming the mother of Jimi Hendrix. So to break all of this down, Jimi's European lineage was on his mother's and father's side, 
through the unfortunate scenarios of his two black great grandmothers being taken advantage of by his two white great grandfathers. Other than that, Jimmy's grandparents and parents on both sides were black. Furthermore, many black families can sadly relate to Jimmy's family composition as many black women in the United States back in its infancy were taken advantage of by lustful slave masters and other white men in authority. It's a shameful part of history that can't be sugarcoated. It must be addressed head on and bluntly, even if it offends people. So now comes the part of Jimmy's early life that most people are familiar with his humble beginnings in Seattle's Central District. Jimmy was born on November 27, 1942, with his original name, Johnny Allen Hendricks, given to him by his mother, Lucille. His father, Al, was away at World War II when Jimmy was born. Upon Al's arrival back home to his son, Jimmy, he promptly changed Jimmy's legal name to James Marshall Hendricks. Al felt that Jimmy's birth name of Johnny Allen was due to a former boyfriend of Lucille. I had a chance to take a trip down memory lane in Seattle, Washington with the only person currently alive that was there for the intimate details of Jimmy's childhood, his baby brother, Leon Hendricks. Try, I'm gonna jump in. So I went out there, climbed the ladder, went on the end, and couldn't couldn't jump. It was too high. Yeah. <laughs> and so they said, "You not, we're not letting you. You can't. You have to go that way to get down because these people are waiting to get up." So they start hooting at me and they're like, oh, no. "Look at Mount Rainier." Oh man. Oh, that's Mount Rainier over there, huh? This is where my dad and Jimmy grew up playing and swimming. Um, in the background there, there's a new city, Bellevue. That, I didn't live there. When you looked over there as a kid, what did you see? That was country. It was all trees. It was forbidden. They'd have green cars over there. Wow. If, if you're black. <laughs> wow. That bridge didn't exist, did it? Yeah. Uh, no, it didn't. We only had that bridge. You only had I-90? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you were saying that um, one time when you were a little kid, do you remember about how old you had to be? Jimmy was probably about 14 or 15. Yeah. And you were, you were down here with who? My dad, my mom, and Buster. And you guys were having a picnic here? Yeah. We could go in there and take a shower. Uh, check in, they had, you know, the whole kind of thing in there. Beach you know? house. Yeah, beach house. Looks like it's been boarded up a while. Oh, yeah. But, um, so what happened then? Uh, okay, we, we were picking right on that corner. That tree wasn't, that tree wasn't that big. Yeah, you were picking that corner. That was our corner all the time. Get a picnic. You know, small enough rice and chicken. Trade a salad. And we sit there, and so, the girl was out here. And she screamed because she stepped on this glass. Uh, was it a woman, child? A white girl. A, a young white girl? Like yeah. a girl under 18. Teenager? You don't remember? Girl. Okay. So you're, she was, you're right on that corner right there. Go there, go there. You're right on that corner. <laughs> she was out there. She screamed. She's a, Screen! Oh my God! And then she, she was in panic and she started to, to struggle and go under, and you could see blood come up. So my dad jumped off that thing right there, straight in. Blood was struggling. Grabbed her because he was strong a little man. Yeah. And he grabbed her and pulled her up and brought her here in the, in the aid station. Came from this building and tipped up her leg and everything. And then it got reported to the news media somehow that. You know, they put my dad in the paper. They, he saved this girl. 
drowning after after an accident she had in the water. So Grandpa Al saved a woman's life, a young lady's life. Yeah. And you and Jimmy witnessed it. Yeah. Wow, that's very heroic. I never knew that. Amazing. So this is where you would meet up with mom, with grandma, your mom? They have picnics or family? Yeah, uh, yeah, when we when every every time we got together, you know, my dad still with my mom a lot. And they always came back together and we did family stuff. That's nice. I bet you love her. Yeah. What do you remember about your mother? Everything. What stands out to you? Perfume. Was she beautiful? Yeah. She always wore nice. She's always stylish. Because she was always young. She died at 33. So yeah, because Johnny Brown, the boyfriend that uh, Jimmy was named after, because his name was Johnny. So we don't blame that probably is the problem. Okay, but so what about Johnny Brown? He used to buy a lot of clothes? Yeah. I heard a story once that Anthony Dolores told me that that Grandma Lucille was actually kidnapped and taken down to Portland by a pimp when she was about 14, 15? 15 years old. I didn't, and that uh, that well, Auntie Dolores and, and everybody had to go down there and get her. I never anybody wouldn't tell me that kind of story. Yeah, that's what the story was told to me. Well, you, 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 I used to ask yes, a lot sir. of questions. I used to always be down at Uncle Lawrence's house. I used to love talking to her. This is my spot for some time. Okay. Okay, I remember I was out there doing my thing, and Jimmy and Bobby were right next to me. Bobby's your cousin. That's Jimmy's age, right? Yeah. So I was messing around, and I and I got out of the ground underwater. And I must have lost my breath because I looked at the, all I could see was the sky. And then I seen Jimmy reach over, and I was gone already. I was in euphoria. I was getting ready to just go. No pain or nothing. Oh, wow. You Another were Another world. Were, yeah, you were across the river. Yeah. So he reached out and grabbed me, and and that was the most pain I ever had when I had to get fresh air into my water lungs. Oh, my God. Yeah. So how did he get out? Did he hit you? No, he pulled, he pulled me up and, and pulled me up here, and then the lifeguards came, and... And they didn't need to do nothing on me because I was like coughing and I was up and crying. But that was painful, huh? You never get that pain. Uh -uh. So your brother's Especially just, coming from euphoria. I've been there, Dad. Pain. When I was shot, the same thing happened to me. My body got warm and fuzzy after extreme pain and I felt really good. And I was fading out. It was like a beautiful high. And then all of a sudden, they just start snap shocking me up. Like, with the things are <laughs> shockers. Wake up! Wake up! But yeah. There's your grandkids on the water. Is that what reminded you when you saw your little granddaughter in there? Kind yeah, of because he had to go in the water and get her. Just like a big brother does. Yeah. Uh, caves out. Yeah. And, uh, and play. It looks like they should be a football field here and a baseball field at the other end. Wow. It's where we, we, me and Buster play uh, football. He was in, uh, I was in Bantam League and he was in Pee Wee League or something. Okay. Catfish Corners right down the street. I know. They closed. Yeah. But then they reopened on Jackson, I heard. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I used to bring my kids here at, after Catfish Corner all the time. <laughs> to the I didn't know that hey. you and Jimmy used to play here. Hey, uh, hey, Hello. Hey. We found everything. We found, one time we found this this hummingbird in the nest and it's been dead and we it was dead and then we found out that hummingbirds if their eggs don't hatch they die with it so the egg and, and her were still in there like preserved and everything it was all wow that's amazing i'm gonna take you to the spot where we did that and there used to be a deer that used to live in, in leshite park and we told my dad my dad never believed it never believed it until one day in the newspaper said deer deer hit and killed in Westside Park. Wow. You've been living there all these ten years, you know. Amazing, Dad. Good story, Dad. Um. This is Martin Luther King Park near Six Stadium in Seattle. Wild wooded area. Wild wooded area. Yeah. Okay. Like Force. You think we should go here or? Uh, 
Picture. How, how? How did you take a picture? He came outside. No, he said, Leon, take a picture. I had all the Instamatic camera. What did he say? He said, take a picture of me, of my new jacket and my guitar. And how many pictures did you take? I don't know. One. In them days, you can only take one. <laughs> That's a good picture, Dad. Yeah. And he was so happy. Do you ever remember him being more happy than that? Uh, no. That was a moment. It seems like everybody was happy that day. Yeah. That's a good that's a good piece of history, people, right there. This used to be the red house that Jimmy was talking about in his song. This is where uh, Betty Jean stayed here in Seattle. It's not red anymore, but it used to be. So dad, where are we? We're at uh, Betty Jean Morgan's house, uh, the red house. They're going to Photoshop that red. <laughs> uh, where Jimmy met Betty Jean, you know, Betty Jean was Jimmy's girl, Buster's girlfriend in high school. And, uh, and they were engaged to be married. So it's that house right over there, that, right that barn house. Cool. She, she still has pictures and letters from Jimmy written to Betty Jean, but she won't give them up. Maybe she go talk to her someday. She still lives in that house? Yeah, yeah. They still live in that house? Yeah, all the kids. The grandkids yeah. and all that. Wow. Maybe the mom's not alive anymore. She, she married the bass player. What bass player? From the Rockin' Kings. Who, who was he? I forget his name. You have to do research on that yourself. She's a bird. And I used to go with uh, Maggie Jean Morgan, Betty Jean's sister, so we had a... Like a they got the original windows up there. Yeah, we were in junior high school, Jimmy and Betty were in high school. So did you guys go through the back door, the backyard? No, we went through the front door. We were, me and Jimmy were on it. <laughs> I bet you were handsome, me and Jimmy. Did you see my picture when I was 16? Yeah. That's me. I know. You get started early. You still look handsome, man. I don't know, I still get action. So this was all pretty much the same? Yep. Okay. So it wasn't like pretty like this. So this was a yard? Yeah. I, I'm sure this wasn't. Wow, look at those tiny skinny places behind there. Look at those tiny skinny, whatever that is, They're putting up in river. people's yards. So this was grandma, she had a back patio, or was she, she in the basement? No, she was right here. She was number three. And you remember? Yeah, my daddy's coming pick us up. And, uh, and take us in, uh, I think that porch is new. The porch is new? Yeah, because there wasn't no sliding doors in the 50s. Yeah. The 50s. Yeah, there wasn't. There might have been French doors. I remember I used to, I used to sleep in the dress. So was this an up and down stairs? Wow, Dad. We walked up just to our house. Oh, yep, and here we are on the corner. What street are we on? Let's walk over here. We're on 15th and Yesler. Oh, my gosh. And that's where Chantel... Here we are on 15th and Yesler. That's the Aradell Mitchell home where Chantel Hendricks used to live, which is the um, great granddaughter of Lucy Six. Used to live kitty corner across the street right here. That's amazing. Like I lived there yeah, because he, when they first the got clean. The spirit. Oh my gosh. 
My mama Hankins used to live right there. Old friend of my dad's. She wow. They hit me and Jimmy. We couldn't touch nothing in her house. So number three was where you come to see your mama. Yeah. But how did I, an unlikely vessel living in Augusta, Georgia, by way of New York City, come to embark on this journey, this crusade, this path of most resistance, focusing on, for the last quarter of a century, on what some have called a lost cause. That cause being to ensure that Jimi Hendrix's black legacy gets promoted. That cause being to make Jimi more relatable to younger people of color. And lastly, that cause being to correct the notion that has existed for years that black people don't care for Jimi Hendrix. Well, for some, my age and race may throw people off when it comes to my intense interest in Jimi Hendrix. For others, it may be my location, Augusta, Georgia. Augusta, on the surface, may mainly be known for two things. Number one, the Masters Golf Tournament and the Augusta National with the prestige of the green jacket. And two, the godfather of soul, James Brown. But musically, Augusta has been built on the backs of a trio of diverse black musical geniuses. First, you have the fiery, talented, and passionate Sharon Jones, who some consider affectionately as the female James Brown for the way she brought her A-game every time she graced a stage. You know what? This home thing, what I need to do now is take y'all on back a little bit farther to my home, my hometown of Augusta, Georgia. Huh? And while we going back to Augusta, I'm going to take y'all back in time. Let's imagine this. 1965. Now in 65, they used to dance. They had all kind of dances. But Mr. Brown, down in Augusta, he had his thing going on. And what I'm going to do is take it on down there to Augusta, Georgia. But we're going to get on a train. And we're going to call this the Soul Train. Now don't y'all want to ride with me. Come on, you're riding, right? Then there's the elegance, grace, and class of the legendary opera singer, Jesse Norman, who wowed audiences across the world with her stunning feats of operatic excellence. And last, but certainly not least, is a man that has always represented Augusta all over the world, James Brown, who continues to receive accolades after his death. His footprints were left all over this globe, but if you want to visit the epicenter, the nexus, or as Bobby Bird would say, the headquarters, for all things James Brown, you gotta visit his city, Augusta, Georgia. So 
Every time I represent Jimi Hendrix and tell people I'm from Augusta, it's with a sense of musical pride that I do so as I reflect on a triumvirate of musicians that stood for the same mastery of their craft as Jimi Hendrix. First time I saw Jimmy, I was in uh, Macon, Georgia, and there was a guy down there named Johnny Jenkins. They had a group called the Pine Toppers, flamboyant guy, man. Uh, you know, do the splits with the guitar and all this kind of stuff, man. And so I was really down there checking him out, and that's when I first saw Jimmy. So after a while, uh, when I see Jimmy, uh, he'd be coming toward me uh, with a guitar in his hand. And it took a while for me to see him with a guitar case. And I remember one, I remember one time, I said, man, where, why you don't have a, have a guitar case, man? Now he said, man, I don't play the case. <laughs> I play the guitar. And we'll sit up in the hotel, the Bellevue, man, and and I leave and come back, he'll still be there and, and playing the guitar. And, and he'll say, hey man, uh, oh, you got a Pepsi Cola? <laughs> Some soda crackers? Because, <laughs> hey man, listen, we was the poets that needed the boys. Uh, but we were playing music. You, you see what I mean? And then, here comes Jimmy with a dog on foot pedal, man. And I didn't know, I didn't know know that much about it, uh, but I hadn't, I, uh, uh, I hadn't had one personally, uh, myself, uh, to try to use it. Uh, but the first one, it was, uh, it wasn't a wow, uh, wow, wow, wow. It was a fuzz tone. It was uh, like, like, uh, like a bunch of bumblebees. <laughs> and so after a while, man, the people started looking at us. Uh, 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 we would be, we would be together a lot. Uh, Jimmy still live, man. See, 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 because I can see him, uh, because he lived there. <laughs> you got me the body gone, uh, but his legacy, and the people who who have been fed on the way he do things, is still being fed. And you know about guys like you, Corey Washington. Man, who fighting this wall, man, to dig out every every leaf on the truth? 
Um, because everybody, uh, uh, most of these books is not going to include me. You, you see, they they know about me, but they don't include me. You know, uh, uh, more so. But uh, uh, um, uh, because every every time they they do a book or a movie, they start from when he became successful. I mean, we was always successful. Man, you know, we make three three dollars a night. We was cool. <laughs> Got a little bit of that got that will. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Got that will. Gonna be a star one day. I got that will to learn. And my name gonna be on top. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. My name gonna cover the world. And you gonna know me. It's gonna be sucking it to you, making everybody happy. You gonna know me, yeah. It's gonna be pretty girls, pretty clothes. Do you know? Dig it. Yeah. I want to sing that Jimi Hendrix part. Play that one. one um, play wait, wait, wait. Sing a Jimi Hendrix part. Wait, wait, wait. When he said, oh, okay. Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. Tell me. What did he say? Play me a me guitar. guitar. He made it. And yes, he did. Yes, he did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. yeah. you going to know, man. I gotta be pretty calm, pretty cold. Do you know? Dig it. Oh, gonna be in your town, farming on stage, yeah. singing my hit record. Yeah. Listen to this. Do you know how I know? Got that will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, brother.